The history of the northeast of England is a long and winding story. Along the way, there are familiar sights to see, strong images and key milestones, such as the construction of Hadrian's Wall, the Viking raid on Lindisfarne. This is the land of famous saints such as Aidan and Cuthbert. It is also a place of infamous sinners such as the Border Reavers. This land is peopled by brave seafarers such as Grace Darling. And of course, it was one of the cradles of the Industrial Revolution, where mighty ships were built on the River Tyne and locomotives and trains had their start. The broader story of the Industrial Revolution is replete with names of inventors and their inventions, such as James Watt, who created a steam engine, Richard Arkwright and his water-powered mill, Josiah Wedgwood, known as the father of English potters and also an ingenious salesman, Michael Faraday, who invented the first electric motor in 1822, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who at just 20 years old helped his father design and construct the 1,300 foot Thames Tunnel, and crucially, here in the Northeast, the Stevensons, George, the so called father of railways, and his son Robert, who designed the most advanced locomotive of its day, Stevenson's Rocket. But what of John Erpeth Rastrick? We examined a little of his father's work in a previous video about the daily grind for our bread and butter and how industrialization changed the way we farm and indeed the way we feed ourselves forever. But what of John Senior's son, John Erpeth Rastrick? John Erpeth Rastrick was born in 1780 and died in 1856. He was an engineer, an inventor, a member of the Royal Society, and was one of the first English steam locomotive builders. When you search for John Erpeth online, one of the first and only images you will find of him is likely to be this one. But this is not John Erpeth Rastrick. Rather, this is his father. It's a bit annoying, um, as I'm a direct descendant, and I also am an archivist and a genealogist, and I like to get things accurate and correct. Mm -hmm. um, how it started? How it started? I think it started because there is no portrait of John Orpeth Rastrick, who apparently did not want his portrait taken or made during his lifetime. So there is there is no record of what he looked like, and the names are so similar. So I think people, you know, who more people probably know about John Erpeth and just seized on this um, engraving of John Rastrick, the father, and just assumed, just assumed, um, yeah. And so, in the creative tradition of engineers such as John Erpeth Rastrick, we made our own. Here he is, a wonderfully made, knitted John Erpeth Rastrick. John Erpeth was born on the 26th of January, 1780, here at Bullers Green in Morpeth, Northumberland. It is thought that he attended local public schools, though he may have been sent away to school in Yorkshire, but by 1795, aged 15, he was apprenticed to his father, John Senior, this John. The Rastricks family workshop was at the back of the house on Bullers Green, effectively at the bottom of the garden. Here it can be seen on a map from 1826, marked in red. The same year he was apprenticed to his father, industry such as mining was already accustomed to making use of trackways to transport coal in wagons from mines to, for example, the River Tyne. This wooden trackway was uncovered by archaeologists in 2013, excavating on the banks of the River Tyne in Wool's End. Maybe that's the real archaeologist. 
and we're on the site of a 18th century wagon way. It's covered over at the moment uh, due to the wood being in poor preservation, but we think it dates from around 1780. The top line here is a uh, 4 foot 8 standard gauge railway, the first ever discovered. Um, it's all timber as well, um, which makes it pretty, pretty unique in, in terms of uh, early railways. It, it really uh, adds to the chronology of, of the railways. The lower section of the rail that we've got it also makes this site very unique. It's a small uh, offshoot of the main railway, which um, would have left the left the track just up by the embankment, joined it up again just around where we are now. And it was used to uh, wash the wheels of the wagons, so there would have been a water supply running into it constantly, and uh, that would have been that would have been used to keep the keep the wheels wet, wash off any excess uh, coal or dirt. Uh, there was a, there's a causeway in between for the horses to walk on because it was a, a horse drawn uh, wagon way. Um, that, that really makes this site very unique because nothing like that's ever been discovered either. So we're, on, we're looking at something very rare, very rare. This was an exciting time as engineers across the country were looking for an alternative to horse-drawn wagonways. In 1802, aged 22, Rastrick was hired by the Ketley Ironworks in Shropshire, and by 1807 he had partnered with John Hazeldean in Bridge North, Shropshire, to trade as Hazeldean and Rastrick. Together they built the locomotive Catch Me Who Can in 1808. On Christmas Eve 1810, Rastrick was married to Sarah Jervis, and over the next 11 years went on to have six children. It was around this time that Rastrick began working with Richard Trevithick. Together they worked on Trevithick's ideas for high-pressure steam engines and locomotives, that is an engine that could move itself along a rail track. In 1812 Rastrick testified before Parliament that he had been responsible for constructing the locomotive that had been demonstrated in London that year. In 1814, Rastrick was awarded a patent 3799 for his steam engine design, and he oversaw the construction of the Chepstow Bridge, during which, incidentally, he apparently had a horse stolen from him. In 1819, Rastrick formed a new partnership with James Foster and moved his family to Stourbridge to begin Bradley Foster Rastrick & Co., Rastrick was a managing partner in this new firm, and they constructed a purpose-built new foundry in 1821. They produced blast furnaces, rolling mills, and wrought iron rails, along with the first steam locomotives for the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company in 1829, the most famous of which was the Stourbridge Lion, this was the first foreign-built locomotive to be operated in the United States, and simply crossing the Atlantic successfully was something to be celebrated. And though it performed admirably during its initial tests in August 1829, the engine was found to be too heavy for the American tracks, and was never used to haul coal wagons as intended. Around this time, in 1828, the Stourbridge-based foundry became known as Foster, Rastrick and Company. And along with locomotives for the Delaware Company, they constructed the Agenoria. Named for the supposed Roman goddess of industry, Agenoria first ran on the 2nd of June 1829 on the King's Windsford Railway. This was a three-mile stretch of track connecting mines in the Black Country, and the locomotive remained in service until 1864. It was eventually donated to the London Science Museum in 1884, and today can be seen in the National Railway Museum in York. In 1829, Rastrick was commissioned, along with James Walker, a fellow member of the Institution of Civil Engineers, to write a report 
on the economics of using either rope haulage and a stationary engine or locomotives on the new Liverpool and Manchester Railway. The trials would be held at a one-mile stretch of track in Lancashire called Rain Hill. These were the Rain Hill Trials. Ten locomotives officially entered the trials, but on the day of competition, the 6th of October 1829, only five locomotives were able to run. Ericsson and Braithwaite's locomotive called Novelty, Burstall's locomotive Perseverance, the locomotive Sans Paril by Hackworth, the locomotive Rocket by Robert Stevenson and Company, and Brandreth's Cycloped, a horse-powered locomotive. The first locomotive to drop out of the competition was the Cycloped. It used a horse walking on a drive belt to power the engine, but unfortunately it crashed through the floor of the engine during trials. The second locomotive to drop out was the Perseverance. This had been damaged during transit to the competition site, and though Burstall spent five days of the competition repairing the locomotive, it failed to reach the required 10 miles per hour for the competition and had to resign. Sans Parel nearly completed the trials, even though it was deemed to be 300 pounds or 140 kilograms over the weight limit for this competition. It completed eight trips back and forth before cracking a cylinder and it had to withdraw. Novelty was the last to drop out. It had actually been a crowd favorite, reaching an astonishing speed of 28 miles per hour but it suffered a damaged boiler pipe which could not be fixed on site. It was disqualified. And so it was Stevenson's rocket that was the only locomotive to complete the trials. It averaged around 12 miles an hour or 19 kilometers per hour and achieved a top speed of 30 miles per hour, hauling 13 tons and was duly declared the winner of the trials and received a 500 pound prize around £47,000 in today's money. And of course, Robert Stevenson and company had won the lucrative contract for the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. They also accepted passengers on the line between Liverpool and Manchester, in addition to freight and cargo. John Erpeth Rastrick was one of three judges on that fateful day to declare Robert Stevenson's rocket victorious. Rastrick's notebook from the Rainhill Trials today forms part of the collection of the Science Museum. It's a crucial document for this period of the Industrial Revolution and shows how observant and meticulous he was in his role as a judge for what was a crucial competition that would change history. So here on the banks of the River Tyne, the uh, landscape around here was changed forever uh, with the Industrial Revolution and the works uh, of the railways built by the Stevensons and the likes of Rastrick. The Stevensons built the high-level bridge or designed the high-level bridge behind me, which brought the railway through from London all the way to Berwick, where it later joined up with a railway to Edinburgh. The high-level bridge itself is, uh, is a multi-level bridge, two layers. The top level carries trains through to Newcastle and beyond. The second level, the lower level, brings uh, road traffic in from the other side, a single lane road. The bridge is quite narrow, which was rather cost-effective in the building of it. It meant that they could use fewer materials in the building of the bridge, but still bring raw materials and passengers into the city of Newcastle and the surrounding area. The railway didn't just change the industrial nature of Britain, it changed the societal nature of the country as well. With trains bringing passengers to towns and cities and further afield, people were travelling to the seaside resorts which were springing up across the country. Not only did it uh, open up holidays to people, the railways opened up the possibility of commuting as well, enabling the towns and cities to grow, to spread their footprint and uh, allow commuters to travel into towns and cities yet live out in the suburbs. Ultimately, the Industrial Revolution and the engineers, the likes of Rastrick and the Stevensons, led to changes across the country, linking towns and cities as never before. And so, this is how a young lad from Morpeth, a talented and visionary engineer, helped to shape the world as we know it today. Whether we're commuting to work, off to visit family, 
or looking for a next adventure in some far-flung corner of the country, we have in part John Erpeth Rastrick to thank. Our railways are not only an important part of our history, but they're crucial to everyday life. They connect us to each other, to our history, and to the stories of great engineers like John Erpeth Rastrick. <laughs>